So good afternoon, I'm Philip Burgess and um, myself, Petrus Kange and Nick Bear would like to present uh, some highlights of our research uh, collaboration through the Liverpool Blantyre link. This has been a strong international research collaboration. I've listed some of the highlights of our uh, research in the recent past on this slide. And now I'd like to hand over to Nick, who's going to take you through in a little bit more detail some of the studies we've, uh, we've performed recently. So yeah, I'm just going to talk about our study of cost effectiveness of screening for diabetic retinopathy and laser treatment, uh, which we did in Blantyre. And this was part of the Malawi diabetic retinopathy study, but we thought it was important to demonstrate that this uh, model of screening and looking for patients with diabetic retinopathy and treating with laser was cost effective because of the rapid increase in people with diabetes in sub-Saharan Africa. Essentially, we found that it was cost effective, uh, 400 US dollars per quality adjusted life year, uh, and that meets the WHO definition of cost effectiveness, which is uh, linked to GDP. Uh, and so for Malawi is low, but it, it still was cost effective. And that's great because it shows uh, this, is, this is a useful and cost effective uh, approach to managing diabetic retinopathy in sub-Saharan Africa. And another area of uh, research we've been involved in is beauty, but some of you will be less familiar with, which is malarial retinopathy. Yeah, so we've been researching malaria retinopathy in Blanta for uh, many years and showing that it's diagnostic for a child in coma with a uh, parasitemia, even though parasitemia is common in the population. And it also has prognostic information. Uh, the worse the malaria retinopathy, the higher the risk of uh, death from cerebral malaria. But it's quite difficult to visualize, particularly for a physician uh, with a direct ophthalmoscope. You can see the hemorrhages, but you can't see other features well because they're too peripheral or too subtle. And you really need an indirect ophthalmoscope to see it well. So we are developing automated grading so that physicians can access the information uh, from the malaria retinopathy using a low cost fundus camera. And we're in the process of optimizing the uh, image analysis at that time with our um, collaborating US company Vision Quest, uh, who are uh, developing the software for that. And as well as academic achievements, it's important for us to demonstrate impact of our research. We're focusing on the case of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, we've uh, increasingly been able to develop um, links and relationships with the Malawian government, so the Malawian Ministry of Health, to uh, affect changes in policy. We're, we're really um, delighted to see that um, through uh, hopefully with the help of international collaborations, including ours, but also importantly the Scotland a long way link, that um, a screening and referral systems for diabetic retinopathy are now operating successfully in the central hospitals in Lantyre and a long way. And there's a strong training uh, pipeline coming through, um, overseen by uh, uh, Petrus Kangi and in partnership with the German groups, there's another international collaboration uh, developing uh, training uh, ophthalmologists and ref res future research leaders in, in Malawi. And we've also developed excellent relationships with the uh, Diabetes Association of Malawi and got our message out to the public through um, events that um, have involved national newspaper coverage. So um, Nick's now going to talk a bit about the uh, shared learning that we've been able to achieve, so mutual benefits for both individuals and institutions. Yes, so we've really found, particularly in the sphere of diabetic retinopathy, that the service provision has grown out of research projects. Um, the research projects provide sustained funding at the beginning to get uh, clinics going, and then um, as the demand has grown, so the services have grown and taken over from, from them. And research projects provide a kind of uh, mutually beneficial goal for both parties. We, you know, this has um, been a great collaboration working together and allowed career development for both sides of the link. Thanks very much. So that's just hopefully a few of the uh, highlights from our uh, strong international partnership we've developed and we're looking forward to continuing over the uh, 
in in the future. And myself, Nick, or Petros would be happy to answer answer questions on Friday about that. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have heard some of the great things that are happening, you know, to do with uh, tackling the issue of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, you know, the shared learning, the enhanced partnerships. We've we've also, you know, heard quite a lot about, you know, the continued networking that is coming out from there. And of course, just to to put everyone in perspective of what the diabetic retinopathy network is all about, uh, we are just going to go into the next presentation that is going to give us an overview of the DRA network. Uh, links and uh, of course uh, just to give everyone um, an understanding of what the network is all about. In a previous session this morning, we heard about the retinoblastoma network. And I am now going to give an overview of a second network, the Diabetic Retinopathy Network, the DNNet, which also came about as an extension of the Vision 2020 Links program. As we heard earlier, the original remit of the Vision 2020 Links program was to establish training partnerships with the objective to improve the quality and the quantity of eye care services in Africa. The links have since become a platform for other programs and for the networks. And the Vision 2020 Links program started in 2004 and now has 30 UK link partnerships, 17 of them with African countries. In 2013, we realized that over 20 of the links had chosen as their priority um, condition to train um, either pediatric ophthalmology or diabetic retinopathy. And there was a clear pattern that these two issues were becoming um, quite relevant in the strategic plans of many links. So the DRNet as a network was then set up in 2014 and it was based on the existing link partnerships that were already working uh, towards improving diabetic retinopathy services. Forming a network allowed all these links to meet together, to share learning, to grow, and eventually to also extend to 23 links over the five years um, with Pacific and Caribbean countries joining in. In many cases, the DRNet services in some of the countries were either non-existent or they were rudimentary or they had treatment services, but they were looking to establish a better way of screening people with diabetes. The links through the UK partners were able to tap into the experience of the National Diabetic Eye Screening Program in the UK, which screens over 2 million people per year in the UK. This program has one of the world's highest coverage for the air screening at national level. Just like the individual links, the networks are also about teamwork and both interprofessional and multidisciplinary teams. And in diabetic retinopathy, the team is really essential. Um, this team approach includes the obvious professions um, that we need for the air screening and treatment, um, like the screener graders, the nurses, or the ophthalmologists. But just as important are the data technicians, the endocrinologists, the managers, and even Ministry of Health officials. And this applies both to the teams um, from the UK and the teams from Africa, the Caribbean, or the Pacific Islands. So when the network was formed, Um, the first meeting was uh, used to agree a target and a, and a way forward for action. And it was agreed that um, the, the, every link in that network would treat at least one person a week more for the five years, the first five, five years of the network. And we calculated this would equate to saving 
37,500 blind years. This was done through different ways. Um, there were more than 92 training, reciprocal training visits where the teams from Africa came to the UK, um, from the Caribbean to the UK, and also the UK teams went to do um, direct training in country. Uh, we also had four large international workshops where all the link partners were invited. More than 90 ophthalmologists were trained in laser treatment across the network. And we have more than 80 screen operators uh, being qualified with the international eight month uh, qualification for screening, grade, grading, screening and grading run by the Gloucester uh, group in the UK. This is an online qualification. Um, this original target that was to treat about 3,750 extra patients collectively as a network was actually doubled and more than 8,000 patients were treated and approximately 8,000 years of, of sight saved. As a collective, the network uh, increased the, the screening capacity by 88% in these countries and uh, as a total, the treatment increased by 47%. Another of the aspects that um, was a key work of the network was to include Ministry of Health officials and policymakers in the teams. And this uh, often uh, catalyzed the work of the individual country teams to produce national guidelines, for example, the Kenya uh, DR guidelines, Uganda, Tanzania, Zambia, and others that are underway, like in the Caribbean, Malawi, or Ghana. And the value of developing appropriate guidelines for diabetic retinopathy that are context specific and implemented ensures quality across the um, programs. I'm going to leave it here, and we are going to hear now from uh, several of these links. Um, the Malawi and Five link in Scotland, the link between Zambia and Frimley Park Hospital in the UK, um, the link in Calabar, Nigeria with Wolverhampton, and the link with St. Lucia in the Caribbean and Frimley Park. And each of them are going to present um, their experiences with the, with the program and the partnership, their achievements, and the way forward uh, for the future. Thank you. Thank you. So the first of these presentations coming is the uh, St. Lucia Frimley Park link, and we're going to hear from that team now. Diabetic Retinopathy Program is funded by the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Trust through a two-year grant held at the International Centre for Eye Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. The Vision 2020 Links Program is an initiative to give eye institutions in low- and middle-income countries the skills and resources to develop high-quality eye care services for the populations they serve. The Diabetic Retinopathy Program was launched on February 5, 2018 in St. Lucia. St. Lucia, a small developing Caribbean country with an incidence of diabetes of 11.5%, did not have the capacity for diabetic retinopathy care on Ireland. Patients who required that service traveled overseas at very high cost to them. Many patients who did not have the funds to seek care sadly went blind. This program has given us the human resource capacity to provide services to our patients integrated into our primary care services and free of charge. The program consisted of training of healthcare workers within the primary care system to include nurses, health aides, consultant ophthalmologists to provide the service. The provision of equipment to support the service, health education support and technical support and monitoring. The program has been implemented by training our public health officers to ensure sustainability. 
One of the highlights of the program was the many opportunities for human resource development. It commenced with the workshop for the steering committee for the planning of the national program. The biomedical engineer, the screeners, the graders, and ophthalmologists, they were also trained in 2017. In May 2020, the Vision 2020 exchange was facilitated with Frimley Park Hospital. Frimley Park Hospital's team was also instrumental in training in country our screeners and graders. The screeners and graders also participated in the Certificate of Higher Education in Diabetic Retinopathy Screening with the Gloucestershire Royal Hospital online course. Under the Diabetic Retinopathy Program, screening services were made available in the north of the island and also in the south. The treatment services was also developed at one of our wellness centers with a well-established referral system for care. As of April 2020, a total of 2,855 patients have been screened and 328 patients have received laser treatment. As we continue to strengthen the National Diabetic Retinopathy Program in St. Lucia, we aspire to expand screening services to other communities, increase the numbers being screened and treated, and to continue training new screeners and graders to ensure sustainability. Hi, I'm Professor Geetha Menon, and uh, with the team from Primley Park Hospital, we were part of the link uh, that actually went to St. Lucia um, to develop diabetic retinopathy screening in the island. The team, along with me, uh, went to um, went through reciprocal visits. So we went to the island, and we also had the team from Saint Lucia come to visit firmly. And what we did was de develop a really good competency-based screening, a training program for for training the graders and screeners in Saint Lucia. We also trained the ophthalmologist in laser treatment. And um, I think that the best bit of this link has been the fact that um, through the link, we were actually able to get the Ministry of Health in St. Lucia to be involved right from the beginning. The ministry actually therefore owned the program. They made sure that they had enough screeners and graders uh, trained within the program. And uh, now we actually have a very good uh, screening program for diabetic patients across the whole island. We've also had the additional advantage that they've had laser, laser um, treatment available uh, for all the patients, which has meant that this, this program actually has the highest treatment rate as well. I still remember going to the, uh, to the island for the first time to teach screening and grading, and the patients that came on that particular day, there, were, there was quite a lot of patients with proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Setting up the screening program here has meant that we were able to save a lot of patients from going, going blind. Good day, my name is Dara Burt. I'm the consultant of ophthalmology in St. Lucia with the Diabetic Retinopathy Screening and Treatment Program. The other team members include screeners, graders, an optometrist, a family nurse practitioner, HMIS team, and various stakeholders from the Ministry of Health. The collaboration with the Vision 2020 Links partnership has been very beneficial to us, especially in boosting our human resource development. So far, we have 13 fully qualified screeners and graders with the program. We have screened over 2,800 patients. We have lasered over 300 patients. And now, St. Lucia can effectively treat and manage diabetic retinopathy. Thank you, and we're looking forward to continue collaboration with the Vision 2020 Links Partnership. The partnership with the Vision 2020 Links program in St. Lucia has been amazing. It has facilitated the development of our primary healthcare team to support the establishment of our own diabetic retinopathy program in St. Lucia, with screening services, grading, and laser services to all of our diabetic patients. These services are provided free of charge to all our patients. The collaboration has been extremely useful as it has reduced blindness due to diabetic retinopathy in St. Lucia. Thank you very much to the teams in St. Lucia and Frimley for the presentation, which is uh, very, very interesting and, and thorough. Uh, we're going to move on to another team that also works um, 
in diabetic retinopathy as part of a link, and that is the uh, Calabar in Nigeria with uh, Wolverhampton in the UK link, and we'll hear from them. Good afternoon. Thank you for asking the Calibre Wolverhampton Vision 2020 link to present today. I am Nick Price, the Link's UK coordinator at the Royal Wolverhampton NHS Trust. And I am Afil Ibanga, the Link's Nigeria coordinator and consultant at the University of Calibre Teaching Hospital. The Link Memorandum of Understanding was signed off in 2014. We are grateful for the support the Vision 2020 Links program and the senior management of both institutions have given us throughout the two three-year activity plans. Four priorities for training have been identified and have been undertaken. Medical retina, in particular diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, pediatric ophthalmology, and leadership skills. Although training in many other spheres, such as biomedical engineering, optometry, nursing, and clinical governance have also featured in the partnership. In Calibre, we are particularly fortunate to have the driving force of Professor Dennis Nkanga, who leads the Diabetic Retinopathy Service. In cooperation with the Lagos Group and with the support of the Vision 2020 Links program, progress is being made towards establishing a national diabetic retinopathy screening program. Prof, over to you. Thank you, Nick. The Calabar Diabetic Retinopathy Screening and Treatment Service commenced in January 2015. It is a facility-based core recall annual screening program. Every patient with diabetes 12 years and above is invited for screening. The LINCS program has given priority to the training of staff, both for screening and treatment. The service is delivered by a multidisciplinary team from the Lions UCTH Diabetes Center, a one-stop service point for diabetes care. One of the major priorities of our team has been raising awareness, collaboration within the community and advocacy. We have worked together with primary care physicians, community pharmacists, laboratory scientists, nurses, the state primary healthcare development agency to create awareness of the program within the community. The statistics is shown in the next slide. So far, we have registered about 37% of the people living with diabetes in our city. Screening rates are still low because we have an ophthalmologist sitting down to do slit lamp examination once in a week on these patients. We believe that when we deploy photographic screening, the numbers will increase even more. We have worked together with our colleagues in Lagos and uh, the Lagos University Teaching Hospital to agree on unified screening protocol, unified treatment guidelines. We have worked with the ophthalmology society to raise awareness on diabetic retinopathy. Last year, the National Diabetic Retinopathy Steering Group met. With the leadership of Dr. Kolo in the Federal Ministry of Health, we are in a step ready for the national stakeholders meeting. Every other aspect of our ophthalmology service has been affected by the links, and that has been shown in this slide. Back to you, Nick. Thank you, Prof. Of course, there should be mutual benefits to a partnership. Comments made by members of this team after a visit to Calibre show how partnerships can be a win-win deal. I value more our spectacular NHS and how lucky we are to work in this environment. I improved on my ability to deliver lectures and facilitate workshops. It taught me to repair equipment with limited spare parts to get the equipment working. It increased my awareness of prevalent conditions in different countries and focus on preventative eye care. 
So a final word from Afyon. Thank you, Nick. Um, we have come a long way since 2014 in this partnership. All we have shared today would not have been possible without all the institutions and individuals listed on this slide. We are grateful to everyone of the people who have been a part of this journey. We have benefited immensely from this partnership and we therefore would strongly recommend partnerships. We'd like to say a big thank you to everyone. Thank you. Robert, you're muted. All right, I hope I'm back on now. Okay, yeah, so I'm start, I was just saying, I mean, uh, we can see that some of the challenges that were, you know, highlighted in the morning um, when Alain Foster presented and uh, highlighted some of the key challenges that we need to, to address as we continue to work and improve eye care services. Uh, through these links programs, we are already on the road to actually uh, making or addressing some of these challenges. And of course, we continue to celebrate um, uh, uh, some of the great outcomes from these partnerships. And uh, without wasting much time, I would like to introduce uh, the next uh, link, uh, which is the Malawi and Fife link. And they are going to uh, give us a highlight of some of the key achievements in the in the past few years. I'm Caroline Sellers. I'm from Fife in Scotland, and we're twinned with the Long Way. And Joseph from Sosa has been a key part of developing these services. But unfortunately, uh, some technical issues means he can't join me today to give this presentation. So the Long Way is in the central region, and I first went there in 2014 and Joseph showed me around the eye hospital here and his main concern about di diabetic eye disease was that uh, patients didn't come to the eye hospital unless they had symptoms by which time it was often far too late to help them. Just across the road is the um, diabetes clinic and we had a visit there so here are all the patients waiting to be seen. The most impressive thing for me was the um, patient education that's delivered by nurses every morning before the clinic. However, this diabetes education talk didn't include anything about the importance of eye screening um, in diabetes eye care, in, fact, in, in general eye diabetes care. So we decided that education um, was probably the best way to start off a diabetic eye service in, in Malawi. And since 2014, we have been running courses involving lectures, small groups, patient um, examinations and we have now taught over 200 healthcare professionals including optometrists, ophthalmic clinical officers and nurses to screen for diabetic eye disease, what to refer and how to teach patients how to manage their diabetes as well because quite often their contact with the eye healthcare professional can be um, a very important one for, for education as well. In 2015, we had a, a visitor, that's Sophie Castle of Wessex, who's the patron of the Queen Elizabeth Dunn Golden Jubilee Trust, and she's the Queen's representative, and she came to visit us, and this is her, um, she spent probably about an hour, and Joseph will tell you all the, the build up to that, it took many days, but she spent about an hour with us, and here she is chatting to a patient, you can see the delegates here, and they're holding their, their arc lights, which is the um, ophthalmoscope, um, that costs about five to 10 pounds, and uh, it's provided to all of our delegates so that they can use that for direct ophthalmoscopy. Um, and it's been kind of instrumental to us being able to deliver this. So Sophie came for about an hour, as I said, and then afterwards when we finished the course, we had a look on news websites to see what they said about her visit. So, and most of it was really about her hair clip and her shoes and not very much about um, the, the projects that she'd been to visit, but that's how it is. The highlight of the course for me is Olive here. She's um, a very experienced diabetes nurse and she gives a talk to the delegates with um, Moira, who's a 
patient representative um, and um, they talk about how to give advice to, to patients with diabetes um, regarding food, foot care. My, the highlight for most of us is her, uh, she acts out as an impotent scenario, uh, which is unforgettable really. And um, I also enjoy how innovative uh, everyone has to be with diabetes in, in Malawi. This is how you keep your insulin cold if uh, you don't have a fridge. Hasn't all just been in Malawi, there have been visits to Fife as well, here are Dorothy and Eric uh, receiving the Topcom camera that was donated to them when they came for their visit and then here's Eric behind the, behind the wheel in, uh, in Malawi using it and that's been really good for um, diabetic eye screening in Lilongwe. And this is an, another two visitors to Fife, unfortunately they chose uh, the moment when the beast from the east was just arriving, you can see the snow just starting in the background. Um, they assured me when they arrived that they were very used to cold because they come from the north of Malawi. However, I don't think they wish to experience anything like that, um, nor do we really. Um, especially when you think this is our fourth, the fourth day of our three day course, um, and these are the shores of Lake Malawi. Um, and I'm sure they were dreaming of that while we were battling through the snow. It's a big team effort. Um, so we have created this. Um, across the whole of Malawi, we have the same screening criteria and teach everybody across the whole. You'll see that the, the map of Malawi here, everybody puts in where they come from. They come from the very top of Malawi along from the extreme south as well. So um, and it's a big team effort and it now involves lots of registrars from the UK and from Malawi, as well as the consultants, three consultants from the northern, central and southern regions of Malawi. And it's been a privilege for me to be part of that. Thank you. In the next presentation, we are going to listen to Professor Gita Menon uh, from the Frimley Park, um, as well as Dr. Mumamlenga, who is the National Care Coordinator for Zambia, as they share insights on the Zambia Frimley Park link uh, that started way back in 2011. Hi, I'm Professor Geeta Menon, and um, the me, myself with the team from uh, Frimley Park Hospital in Surrey um, developed a link with Kitwe Central Hospital through the Vision 2020 Links program. And this is special to me because this was our first link that Frimley had. We've had many more links after this. Um, Kitwe Central Hospital wanted us to actually look at developing diabetic retinopathy screening because lots of the patients coming to that hospital at that time were going blind because of diabetes. So we set up a competency-based training program to train screeners and graders in the hospital as well as train them for laser treatment. Through the Kitwe Central Hospital, the national eye coordinator was keen that we actually roll this program out through the whole of Zambia and also managed to get some support from the Ministry of Health. This has meant that we managed to get equipment in the form of fundus cameras, um, in laser machines and OCT machines in five of the main central hospitals in Zambia. Um, like I said, this link is special to me and it, with the reciprocal visits that we've had, um, it, it has meant that this program has taken off really well and this is a trailblazer as far as diabetic retinopathy screening and treatment is concerned in Zambia. So thank you so much. Of course, we've just had a highlight from, the, uh, from Professor Keita Menon on the Zambia Freeway link. And uh, building on from that, uh, we also want to get perspectives on that link from the Zambian side. And of course, joining me is 
uh, the representative from the Ministry of Health Zambia, who I'll ask to introduce themselves. Hello everyone, how are you? Uh, it's nice to participate in this program. Kangwamlenga uh, Muma, my name is uh, from Lusaka, Zambia, representing the Ministry of Health. I'm the National Health Coordinator. I've had the chance to work pro with Professor Gita Menon on the link uh, between the Frimley Park Hospital then, and now the Frimley Park NHS Trust, I think, uh, with Zambia. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Moma, for that. Of course, uh, building on uh, what uh, Professor Menona said, uh, can you just tell us a little bit more uh, the background of the Zambia Freemi Link? How did uh, this link come up um, and when did it start uh, in Zambia? Yeah, so the, the link started in December 2010. Uh, it was initially between the Kitwe Teaching Hospital I Department that time and the Frimley Park Hospital. Uh, uh, so as you may be aware, the Kitwe uh, Teaching Hospital I Department is now, a, is now a hospital. It's now called the Kitwe Teaching I Hospital. So that link started with the, uh, the two institutions and they collaborated for about three years. Uh, that's when we got to know about it as Minister of Health. And by then, uh, there was a study that had been done on the copper belt on diabetic retinopathy. It was to do with the prevalence of diabetic retinopathy in the copper belt province. Also. So we got to know about it and the results were quite uh, alarming. Uh, it is at that point that we decided that we needed this program to come to Lusaka and from there it gets to, the, to all parts of the country. Okay, so talking about the Zambia uh, Freemi Link uh, program, so how was the program delivered? How was it implemented? And are you also uh, maybe just um, share with us some of the key highlights in terms of the activities that were implemented under this uh, particular link? Yeah, so the, the, this program had particular uh, areas of interest, which we had to do with the service delivery human resource capacity building uh, in terms of training uh, research and also research uh, and also community involvement uh, of the, the whole program. There was also an element of advocacy uh, and indeed the link and, or collaboration between the Kitwe Teaching High Hospital and the, the Family Park uh, NHS Trust. Okay, talk, talking a little bit more about this link, I mean, uh, it's like there are a lot of activities that were done under it. Um, can you just highlight, uh, you mentioned that uh, a lot of partners, a lot of uh, medical people are involved in this. Um, just uh, give us examples of the key staff and the key partners that you worked with in the implementation of all these programs. Yes, sir. thank you so much, Bob, for that uh, question. Yeah, so we had to collaborate with the other medical personnel who were the physicians, the nutritionists, the nurses who are non-ophthalmic nurses. Uh, we had to collaborate with the Zambia Ophthalmological Society, the Zambia uh, Diabetic Association, and the, indeed the Zambia Medical Association. So we brought in a lot of stakeholders in order for us to be able to deliver the, the, the program and achieve the objectives of the program. Uh, yeah, early on you mentioned that, I mean, the, the program was started initially in Kitwe and then it came to Lusaka and then you, you scaled it up. Um, just uh, how widespread was the, 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 the program, the, the Zambia uh, DRIS program uh, implemented in, 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 the, in Zambia? Yeah, so when we came to Lusaka, uh, we started the program at the University Teaching Hospitals, I Hospital. And then from there, we went to the southern part of Zambia, that is the Livingston Central Hospital. We went to the western part of Zambia, to the Wanika General Hospital, the eastern part of Zambia, that is the Chipada Central Hospital. Uh, 
and uh, we had indeed scaled it up to the northern parts of the country. Uh, that is Mansa and the Kasama General Hospitals. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Muma, for um, giving us an overview of the, of the Zambia and um, Frimley link. And this is all for this session. We're going to have now a participant poll, and I am not sure if we are keeping the questions for later or uh, we should be addressing some of the questions now. Um, I can see that there are a couple of, of questions in the, in the chat. The end, I think, if that's okay. Perfect. Right. <laughs> so we've, we've been hearing lots of good ideas about how um, sharing of material um, can be helping, how the partnerships um, work really well within the links. And we want to ensure that everyone who's on the call here today actually gets the opportunity to contribute as well. So we've set up the participant polls. We've done a couple already this morning. We've got two more this afternoon. And for all these polls, the idea is that um, you can then get a feel of firstly who else there is around um, at the conference, but also you'll be able to give your opinions um, about various things as well, which will help us take the whole Lynx programme forward in the future. So we'll go into the first poll. Um, if we could just take that, please, Graham. So we want to know a little bit more about you. So, so what, what is your role? So you can start um, choosing the most appropriate button, button. So you're either an sort of ophthalmologist, as a consultant, lecturer, professor, independent practitioner, um, you may be a trainee, or some other ophthalmic professional from nurses, clinical officers, optometrists, orthoptists, healthcare workers. And then there are people outside the clinical sphere, whether that be Ministry of Health, Government, Research Management, Admin Finance, um, health promotion, medical students, student nurses, um, we want to know um, what you all are. So if you can manage to find the best button to press, um, and when these bar charts seem to be growing no further, I will then share the results with you. Um, so maybe Robert, um, you'll be able to um, share that. Let's end the poll now. Robert, would you like to give us your comments on what the poll has shown? Yeah, um, ideally, I think we have a lot of um, ophthalmologists, about 54%, as expected, um, which, is a, which is a good thing. And also, uh, we have a lot of ophthalmologists who are in training, um, accounting for about 18%, and um, ophthalmic uh, professionals. And it's good to also note that we have a good representation of, of other people, uh, allied workers, I like to call them, who are connected to ophthalmology. So really, I think it's quite um, a, a, a balanced um, representation and uh, we have quite a good mix of people um, uh, who are participating in this meeting, which is a, which is a great thing. Great. Um, so let's go into the second question. So the second question, um, where this really leads into next session. So we've been hearing a lot about clinical work um, at present, but also the importance of all those other generic skills as well. Um, so what type of additional training would you most like to have? Is it clinical skills training or surgical or skills type of simulation? Um, training the trainers or training in leadership and research? So you're still all clicking the buttons, so we'll just give you a bit more time to do that. Right, that seems to be slowing down, so we'll end the poll. Maybe Kova, you'd like to give us your views. Yes, so this is this is um, quite interesting, and uh, we can see that about forty three percent of of the I think about half of those present voted um, would like more training in leadership and uh, or research, um, uh, followed by training the trainers and surgical skills simulations similarly, and then clinical. 
Um, so it, it does give a little bit of an idea of the sort of a scope of what a link can do. And we, we heard earlier on that there have been links that have focused on, on leadership training and Claire Ingster had uh, uh, talked a little bit this morning at, at her, about her work on that. And we also heard, for example, from, from the Malawi and Liverpool link that the, the, one of the key areas for them was research. Um, so, you know, th those are all things that are within the, the remit of what link um, strategic plans can, can have and it's very interesting to, to see. Great. Well, thank you very much, Kova. So we'll, we will be having another poll at the end of the next session. And also at the end of that session, we'll be having small group discussions as well as um, going back to a whole group discussion. So with those small group dis discussions, we'll explain a little more about how those work. Um, at the time but for the large group discussion we would like some questions raised from the floor so if you've got any questions that you'd like to put into the chat um, use the chat everyone um, to submit those questions and then we'll be able to answer those a bit later on so thank you that's um, the end of the polls <laughs>